Welcome everyone. I really appreciate all of you who've joined in for this webinar on Pathways of Discipleship. It's one of the most crucial webinars that we offer throughout the year and this new form of education I'm really excited about gives us a chance to be with more of you more often. There are two recommended resources that I have for those of you who want to go deeper into how to create a pathway of discipleship for your local congregation uh, or your fellowship. The first one is Stride by Ken Willard and Mike Schreiner. The second is Developing an Intentional Discipleship System by Junius Dotson. Both of those are excellent resources to go much deeper and to help your team at your local church get a little deeper look into what it means to create pathways of discipleship. I also today wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kevin Witt. And I am the Director of Growing Spiritual Transformational Leaders and Camper Retreat Ministries for the conference. And it's a really tremendous blessing for me to be able to do that. And my contact information is listed here. The webinar will be recorded, so you'll have the opportunity to access it later and get this information if it's a little bit too quick for you to write down as we move forward. So let's, let's begin our webinar with prayer together. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to have this kind of technology that brings us together from across the miles. We're also very grateful for life itself and the opportunity to live lives that have meaning and purpose. We pray that as we experience this webinar together and we participate together in it, that it would be another avenue to go deeper in your love, shape us as loving people in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's very important for us when we're talking about pathways of discipleship to understand that it's not a program. Uh, pathways of discipleship are avenues that we create so that people can go deeper in their Christian walk. And what do we mean by Christian discipleship? I think that there are three passages that really have important insights in that regard. The first one is from Mark 12, 30 through 31. And this is when Jesus was asked, what is the most important teaching? And when asked that question, he responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second important thing to remember is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. So when we're thinking about pathways of discipleship, Jesus gives us some real guidance about the focus of that discipleship development. And that is, are we helping people become more loving? Are people loving God at a deeper level? Do they have a relationship with God at a deeper level? And are they loving their neighbors at a deep level? And are they also loving themselves at a deeper level? These sum up the entire teachings according to Jesus. They're all meant to move us in this direction. A second passage that I think is pivotal is from Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. And here we have a dimension of discipleship in which we're inviting other people onto this rich pathway that we have found and that God has invited us onto. And then finally, another passage which is central to our Christian discipleship and faith is from Micah 6 8. God has told you, O human one, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So one of the big questions for us as leaders of our congregations is, are the pathways and the opportunities for deeper faith actually leading people to do justice in the wider society? And I love Cornell West's quote on justice. He said, justice is what love looks like in public. So when we're looking at justice is, 
are are our communities the the laws that they're making the way that we interact with each other from different communities within our wider community are we are we practicing love in public and then loving kindness and to walk humbly with god all of those are aspects of pathways of christian discipleship how do we create a pathway that leads people in this direction Love by its very nature, and this is important, I also think, for all of us to think about deeply, is discipleship, if it's about love, then it's about relationship. Because love is not just a noun. We can define love, but all of us know that that definition is not love itself. It's just a description of something much deeper, much wider. All love is relational. It it happens between So the love between myself and my friends and family, the love between my friends and family and the wider community, the love of all of us in relationship to the rest of creation, all the life forms that God has brought forth, all of these are aspects of relationship. And love itself is experiential. This is a great hint or great clue to a strong pathway of discipleship for your congregation. How are you helping people come into relationship where they not only can learn about love, go deeper in love, but also share that love with one another? And what does it mean for us as congregations and leaders when we're trying to encourage people in opportunities for growth and faith when we know that love is an experience? and that love is relational, and therefore discipleship is relational, and discipleship in its most powerful form is experiential. For example, when Jesus developed his disciples, he didn't say to his disciples, come every Thursday and let's meet and talk together. He said, come follow me into an experience. And as they had these various experiences, the faith became more real to them because it was an actual love in practice. I'd like you to take the next two or three minutes because we're talking about Christian faith and discipleship. How would you define faith? What does that mean? So take the next two or three minutes, grab a pen, a piece of paper, and write out a one sentence definition of faith from your perspective.
Sarah, would you share some of the ideas that are coming in in terms of what is faith? I'd love to. Um, one of the answers from Rory I love is, faith is hearing with your heart and trusting that God will be with you in your next step and breath. Faith is an assurance that God is present. Faith is a complete trust and confidence in someone or something. For me, it's a complete trust and confidence in God through his gift of Jesus in my life. Christopher says, I can't do better than Paul in Hebrews, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Ryan said, trusting that what we cannot see is real and that it impacts our lives. Jean says, faith is believing God loves us and the world. Those are fantastic. Thank you so much for this. I also took some time prior to the webinar to reflect on what I experience to be faith. For me, one way of defining it is faith is trust in and response to the love of God. So let's take a look at our own Wesleyan tradition as we think about why we're trying to create pathways of spiritual leadership and, and discipleship. There are three streams of grace. And when we speak of grace, John Wesley meant by grace, the love of God the love of God that flows to us regardless of what we do. It's not based on our earning it in any way. It, it flows to us. And there are three aspects of grace that he lifts up that I think is part of the Methodist contribution to the Christian faith. The first one is provenient grace. And in modern terms, if we're going to talk to our congregations about this, we don't use the word prevenient very often, and it'll be very difficult for them to speak with their friends if they're using prevenient as a word, although um, certainly that's possible. But a word that I think modern culture will understand, those who are not immersed in the church, is preceding grace. That love of, of God that precedes us even recognizing where it comes from. So preceding grace would be things like um, well, it would be all things that we don't ourselves create. So, for example, prevenient grace, this love of God comes to us in the, in the molecules of oxygen that we breathe. Because without that gift of oxygen, our life is impossible. I'd like you to think about some things that are in your life that you find to be beautiful that you find to enrich your life, to make it more abundant, that you didn't create, but are gifts to you in life that have, that have come to you. And use your chat function again to jot down what are some of the aspects of your life that you're thankful for that you didn't create, that come from the provenient love of God, that come from the flow of God, maybe even before you were a Christian or even aware of your faith for some of you. Uh, what are some of these things? Go ahead. Um, Elizabeth says, the music and stillness of the morning. Carrie says, my son's autism. He is a true gift. Janice says, the bounties of my garden. Summer says, Christ drawing me near to him, always being present in my life, even when I did not know it. Kim said, nature, sunsets, and rainbows. Well, thank you for that feedback. That's, that's really helpful and excellent. So when we're trying to help our congregations understand the importance of pathways of discipleship, having these kind of conversations that we're having now in this webinar can be truly helpful. How then does a pathway of, of discipleship in your congregation help people become aware of the giftedness and the goodness of life. Because many persons come to understand the love of God because of these other experiences. I, I noticed that one person said nature, and that would be echoed in even in the scriptures. Um, the Apostle Paul said they should have known God because of the things God made. And so how do we awaken people to be attentive to their lives and to the lives around them so that they can recognize this gift that is life for us, and that this gift is a form of love that comes from the Creator. And that's where people begin to understand uh, that there is a God, 
and they begin to recognize that they are blessed in their life. So how does our church become a place where there's, as an avenue of this thankful life, of this awakening to the goodness and the gifts of life? A second type of love from God is, in John Wesley's terms, called justifying grace. And justifying grace has its origins in the fact that once we see this flow of love, once we recognize these good things that come to us and that and the love of God is present to us, we also begin to recognize that we have not always been in that flow of love. In fact, sometimes our lack of love has caused destruction, not only in our own life, but it may have caused harm and destruction in the lives of other people. And justifying grace is God's embrace of us, even when we recognize that, even we're, when we're in the midst of not living out who we're truly meant to be. And sin, to me, is really the absence of love. It's not much more complicated than that. Uh, and I think all of us recognize that we're not always in the flow of love. And this embrace, this love from God, becomes an opportunity for us to embrace God back. And I think when we talk about we've accepted Christ into our hearts, what we mean by that is that we see God's love in, in Jesus, we see God's love in Christ, and God's embrace of us through Christ, and we in turn embrace God. So another word, modern term, that might be used for justifying grace would be embracing grace. Our understanding that God has loved us and embraced us, and then our embrace in return. And the forgiveness that we receive and the, and the forgiveness that we extend, but it's more than just forgiveness. It is understanding that our, our identity is meant to be a part of God's love, a part of God's flow, and that's what it means to be a child of God. And that awakening is when we make our commitment to God we make our commitment to be Christian and to, and to a way of life that is a way of love. And then sanctifying grace is the Holy Spirit's continuous work with us to help us to move to what John Wesley called toward perfection. And what John Wesley meant by perfection is very specific. He did not mean that we will never make a mistake. That is not what perfection means in John Wesley's terms. In John Wesley term, it means that we will, we will be motivated and live out of a core that is loving. And that perfection really is perfection in love. So we begin to see that these pathways of discipleship for our congregations are not about a list of things to do, but they are avenues that help people move to be more loving. So it's not the pathway itself that makes us a disciple. It's the outcome, the reshaping of who we are that makes us a disciple. Let me ask a different kind of question that will help us when we think about what are the different experiences that we might offer in our particular pathway of discipleship that fits our church? Because pathways are going to be different in different congregations. There's no, it's not like a factory. Uh, it's, more, it's more like an understanding uh, of who the people are you are that are serving, and then using their uniqueness to develop opportunities for them that work. So my first question to all of us is, how did you become a disciple? How did you become a Christian? What were the different experiences, persons, um, avenues that helped you make the decision that this is who I am and this is the way I want to live. So let's, let's share those because I think that would be a great list for all of us to have when we're thinking about our pathways of discipleship, that we have these kind of elements um, intentionally as a part of our congregational faith formation plan. How did you become a Christian and what were some of the factors that led you there?
I wanted to just give you a, a little insight to who I am and how I became a Christian and share one of the formative pieces, certainly not the only one, but one of the formative avenues for me to become a Christian was actually walking in the woods with my father. There were four of us as children, and we were kind of crazy, and we were all over the place. And when he took us into the forest, he had no opportunity to see animals. He had no opportunity to enjoy the silence. It was complete chaos and complaining and everything that young kids do when they're out doing something that they didn't actually plan on doing, but their parents are asking them to do it. So one of the gifts that he gave all of us is he taught us how to sit in a place and become part of a place. This started out with stillness and silence. And after a while, we got so good at it that we could sit literally for hours motionless and without making a sound. And when we were in that mode, I don't know about my brothers and sisters, but I do know that I had some very profound experiences. One of them I can recall there were two squirrels in the spring who were uh, amorous with each other and they were chasing each other all over the place, up and down trees, running ac across the leaves on the forest floor. And I'm sitting there on a log and I just had my arms laying in my laps. And these two squirrels ran right up my shoulder, right down the other side. They had no idea I was there. And I just took that whole scene in for about 30 minutes and they were completely unaware. I've had deer in the forest um, could sense that I was there somewhere, but couldn't find me. And if you've ever been out in the forest, you can, you may experience the deer will actually stomp their feet and they'll, they'll take a big puff of air in and they kind of whistle to figure out where you are. And this deer was doing it. And by the time it had approached me, I could actually feel it breathing on my, on my neck. It was so close to me. But more importantly than, than those experiences, I had a profound sense that there's something behind this creation, that all this life, I was a part of something bigger. And a, and a rush just went through my body. I can remember it now almost as if it was yesterday and I was only nine or 10 years old. And a love just like an electrical energy just went right through me and I realized I was part of a, of a diverse and beautiful world and that the creator was behind it and that all of us were loved and we're all part of this and in this together. So that was part of my avenue. But I'd like to hear from Sarah some of the other avenues that others of you on the webinar have had. I just wanted to share a few responses that didn't show up in the chat for everyone, but I think are great to share. Um, I grew up thinking Christianity was a culture I was born into. I studied the Bible with some friends and realized that I had to make the decision for myself. I realized that my whole life I hadn't been a Christian. I was just playing the societal role. So one of the things that I really like about that quote is, where do people have the opportunity to make intentional decisions of faith? I know that for me, uh, several of those took place in the camp retreat setting some of them at youth rallies, um, others on retreat when I was an adult. Uh, but it's important uh, because in today's society, I'm noticing there's less and less opportunity for people to actually be invited to make a decision of faith to become a Christian. And as the society becomes less and less um, Christianized, I think it becomes more and more important for us to have those opportunities, not in any way a sense of manipulation or there's no formula that you follow, but just the opportunity uh, for po persons to say, yeah, I see God and I want to be a part of God's family and I want to follow this Christian path. So um, where are those opportunities to make decisions like that? Another answer we received is, I started imitating someone I admired. I spoke with them and learned why they were so at peace. So one of the things to think through as a team of your local church is, 
how do you help leaders mature in their faith to the point where they can become mentors and they they have the love in them and the interest in people to the, that really inspires others to be drawn to it and to that pathway. So in your pathway of discipleship in your local church, is there an intentional way for people to meet each other, be in relationship, especially with people who are mature Christians and who find joy in being a Christian? One last one I wanted to read out. Um, the short answer, but I think it's great. It says, interactions in small groups, having people use my gifts and my minister. Great. And some people in their their thoughts talked about family and how important those family relationships were. Uh, some talked about friendships. So how do we engage families in pathways of discipleship? By the way, the studies are very, very clear from, from a number of different faith traditions that by far the greatest predictor of whether or not a young person will continue their Christian journey or their journey of faith, whatever religion that they're from, is really whether or not their parents and their family is engaged in spiritual practice. So that might be another thing to keep at the top of your list as you're looking at different avenues. There's one other answer I wanted to read out um, from Jacob. It says, the thing that has contributed the most to my growth as a disciple is one-on-one -on -one relationships of mentoring, spiritual direction, guidance, and investment. Great, thank you very much. So that's another thing to consider. Um, the reason why I wanted to ask the question, how did you become a Christian disciple? And then there's a second question, what has contributed most to your growth as a disciple, which we'll um, ask in just a minute, is because it helps us realize that there are some avenues that resonate with a lot of people. So if you ask this question, you'll begin to see things like family, uh, what I call creative dislocation, which means I take a journey which has an intentional focus on on Christ on spiritual formation camps would be that somebody mentioned mission trips service those are creative dislocation I get out of my normal routine I get out of my normal place I get into a new experience and when you get into these new experiences it, it opens up your senses because it's no longer ho-hum normal stuff it's all stuff I don't know what's coming and so all my senses are wide open I can remember vacations that I took 40, 50 years ago and what happened on that vacation, but I can't remember what I had for lunch like Wednesday. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. I'd have to think about it. But what I'm saying is that these creative dislocations or immersions, faith immersions, open up the mind and spirit and open up the memory. And when you pull back those memories, you also pull back whatever you learned through that experience. And so these immersion experiences, creative dislocation, or a new relationship would be very, very similar. Like some people mentioned spiritual directors. Well, when they develop a new relationship with a spiritual director, they'll never forget that person. And attached to those memories are, are the lessons and the relationships that help people continue to grow in love. So some of the things that I experienced 40 years ago are still forming me. And so one of the questions for a local church is how, how, do I, how do I engage those highly formative aspects of people's lives? So for example, how do I engage family? How do I engage creative dislocation or, or journey immersions? How do I engage new relationships? All of these become lasting. And part of what lasts is our love for God and our love for people because these experiences become part of who we are. I'm going to ask a second question now very quickly. What has contributed most to your growth as a disciple? Once you became a disciple, what has contributed most to your growth?
what I'm seeing a lot of, um, I think it's, it might be easiest to sum up some of the answers that keep coming in. Um, a lot of people are expressing that Bible study and other um, types of daily devotion and just getting into the Word really help them to grow. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of answers as well of just time with other Christians, um, either through spiritual direction of a mentor or just um, Christian community and other people doing this walk together. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate that. What, what I'll try to do is I'll try to go back in here and capture the responses that are coming in from all of you. And um, then I'll figure out a way for, if you send me an email, I'll send you a summary of the information that came out so that you can have it. The last question I think for us to wrestle with when we're talking about our pathways of discipleship is how do we get people on a pathway of discipleship who really aren't a part of our faith community? Uh, a larger and larger number of persons are not active in faith communities. And if we're, if we're going to do um, all we can to help people experience love and to be on a pathway of love, how do we connect with people that we don't know? So what are some of the strategies of your congregation or what could be some of the strategies of your congregation to develop new relationship with people so that they can experience you as a loving person, but they can also be connected with others uh, and be inspired to explore what Christ was all about. How, how do you do that in your congregation? Um, I think most of us who are my age that came through as spiritual leaders, we learned how to take care of people once they were in the congregation, but we didn't learn a lot about how, what do you do when they're not coming to your door? So what are some strategies for getting beyond our current relationships into new relationships? Thanks, Sarah. If you'd share some of what people have been expressing, that'd be great. Sure thing. I like Carrie's answer. She said, open the doors and go out into the community, working with outside agencies. Um, let's see, a couple more. Outreach to the community through dinners, Bible school, community service organizations. Marianne says, being intentional about talking with people anywhere and everywhere, rather than looking at the phone building relationships one day at a time. One of the topics to really think through and to pray carefully through is we have the three means of grace, prevenient grace, which is the love that flows to us regardless of whether we're on a faith journey or not that comes to us. And some of what we do, like when we're feeding people who are hungry, that is an actual experience of love. That is the grace of God. That is prevenient grace. How do, we, how do we help people go wider in that circle? So, so they'll ex I think it's fundamental they experience us as loving people. That is the foundation of discipleship anyway, is, is loving other people. How do we help them then recognize God's love for them and then give them the opportunity to grow in love themselves? 
So how do we do the full experience of grace in these various aspects, especially when people are not a part of our community currently? Uh, how do we go about that? That's a, that's a very interesting question. It may depend on your community how that how that works, but I think it's an important one. So just as a summary, We're really looking for pathways of discipleship that goes beyond intellectual exercises, although that's not unimportant for us to have knowledge. That's part of it. But how do we move from head knowledge to a way of being? And when we're examining our current pathway, uh, if you have one, or maybe you, maybe what you discover is we don't really have one. We don't have any intentional pathway that goes the full circle. Um, one way of determining whether or not it's working well is are there more persons who are living lives that do that avoid harm living lives that, that do good and who are deeper and deeper in love with god that may be one way to measure whether some of the new things that you're going to try are are actually working well for you it's important i think to to hear some of the voices from across the denomination when it comes to some of these pieces. Uh, Junius Dotson, who wrote the earlier document that I recommended, said, we have learned from the focus on fixing churches, is what he was talking about. We have learned from this focus that we must move away from fixing churches toward calling and growing disciples. As a church, we are wise to stop spoon-feeding consumers and provide engaging opportunities to reach out and mature in love. Just a thought from somebody else who spends a lot of time on this. And the reason why I think these thoughts are important is because when you talk to your congregation, both the leadership team and, and the congregants, the only way to move them effectively to want to be on this pathway is to begin with why. Why is the heart? Why are we doing this? Why is this important? Uh, that is the heart of the matter. Um, they'll all come on board with how to do it once they're really energized by why. What difference does it make in the world if we just stop growing as Christians? What difference would that make? What difference would it make if we didn't have any pathways for new people to learn about the love of God, the love of Christ, and to grow deeper? What would what would the impact of that be? What would be the impact of that in our community if we actually increase the number of people who are being loved and who are growing in, in, in the love of Christ? How, how might that transform? These are the whys, uh, not so much the hows. And I think that's really where you're going to get traction with your congregation as you roll this out. They're going to have to hear the stories of why over and over again, the story of impact over and over again. Uh, here's another quote that I think is really helpful. An individual must participate in their own growth with God, but we should not assume that they know how to do it, even if they wanted to. That's why intentional pathways of discipleship are important. Now let's shift from the why to the what. What do we mean by pathways of discipleship? Well, I just want to show you some examples. That's probably the easiest way to show you how some congregations have formed this. Here's a pathway. What they're, what they're saying is we would love for people to experience the love of God. You can see that up, up in, the, in the red with the heart in it. So they intentionally have opportunities for, that are centered on experiencing the love of God. So they use worship for that, they use daily devotions, and there might be a number of others, other experiences that are really close, really focused centrally on people experiencing the love of God. Then they have a part of their pathway, they have other intentional things that they use the color green. And the reason why they use different colors is so later on when they put it in the schedule and the church calendar or uh, the leadership for the leadership team, they can see, oh yeah, we, we have intentionally included some grow experiences. 
we've, in, we've intentionally included some love of God experiences so that you're well-rounded in your path, in your pathway. Um, and then, and then there's, you'll see as they go around, we're going to grow together in our own faith, but then down below, we're going to grow in our ability to invite others and to be present, a loving present in the life of others beyond our own congregation, beyond our own circles. And so that becomes one of the dimensions of their pathway. And then finally, we want to, we want to bring justice and we want to change the world. And so once disciples are engaged, let's get out there and, and take this love from a concept into a living reality in the world. And so you can see how they've created a pathway, which is circular, meaning, meaning we don't stop growing. We don't move from one to, to the next as if it's a progression. It's, it's, we want to pass through this over and go deeper and deeper as we go around the circle more and more. And so this congregation has decided we need to make sure that they, they get each one of these elements of the pathway because we believe this is what will help them do what Jesus said. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the end result of all of this. That's the way this congregation image it. Let's take a look at some other examples. I'm going to pull up a few examples that are documents from other congregations that I found and talk about those a little bit. Let me describe to you what this other congregation did. They basically took the means of the uh, prevenient grace, the prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, and then moving on to perfection uh, in love by, by being out in the world. So that's how they did their circle. So we want people to experience the gift, the, the gifts of life and to be out there loving people, providing food that comes from that people need, but can't get themselves provide friendship, provide those things that are, everyone needs take care of the natural world this is all the grace of god it has nothing to do with us it's not transactional in other words i'm not giving this to you so you do something for me this is the free flow of love from the congregation and then they're inviting people into recognizing that so there's conversations there's bible studies there are other opportunities out in the community where people can recognize there is a flow of love and god does love us and that I can embrace God who's embracing me. I can be on this path of love also. And then they move into, okay, how do we grow in our discipleship? How do we go deeper? So all of those are examples. And I'll, I'll um, try to get your email addresses, or you can send those to me by email. My email address is just kwitt at susumc.org. And if you send me an email and say, please send me those documents. I'll send them to you. Uh, but what they did was they created a church calendar every quarter. And on that church calendar, it lists all the opportunities and experiences that have been planned by the leadership team that apply to each of these areas. And I'll show you another way to approach it that is similar. And I think you'll get, I think you'll get the idea. This one, another possibility is what if we took our membership vows, not as a member, not as becoming a member of the United Methodist Church alone, but what if we said our membership vows are based on aspects of discipleship? So this is our, this is our vow of Christian discipleship. So if you were to take that as your model for your pathway of spiritual leadership, you would have these various five different areas that are mentioned in the, in the membership vows. I will be present. So I, I will give my gifts of presence. So presence is community. I will be community for people. I will be present in this community, a contributor, a participant. And through that uh, sense of genuine community, we're all going to be growing in Christian love. I'll also commit myself to prayer. Not just prayer for my congregation. That's part of it but prayer in, for the whole world and for, for those in need and so forth. So I'm going to have a spiritual life and I'm going to have spiritual practices, prayer being just an example of that. So how do you in your, your pathway of discipleship provide learning and practicing spiritual disciplines that help people draw closer to God and be in communication with God? The next thing is G 
generosity. I'll share my gifts, right? My financial gifts, but there's more to my giftedness than my finances. That's part of it. What are, what are my other gifts? So is there some way in your pathway, in your congregation, where you can help people come in touch with their unique giftedness? Um, who they are as a person and how that might contribute to the goodness in the world and then help them be generous in sharing that gift. You know, part of that gift is, doesn't necessarily have to be um, a physical skill. It could be something like my gift is laughter. My gift is, is being attentive to the good things in life. How do you get those people in the right places so that they can share those gifts? And even more importantly, because they're on this intentional pathway of spiritual discipleship, they see their giftedness as a way of contributing God's love to the world. And then the next flow we want to make sure people get into is we actually want them to use those gifts in service and justice. And so what are the opportunities on your calendar every quarter that give people the opportunity to be in service and justice? And then finally, um, I also sh I'll also share my witness is a new part of the membership vows. So what new relationships am I developing beyond the congregation where I can be a witness to the love of God and I can be a witness to Christ? And so you can see you can see the core of this is loving God and neighbor. That's its purpose. Its purpose is not to just do the activities that are in the five circles around the middle one. It's actually loving God neighbor should be the outcome, right? But these different pieces of the pathway help me do that in a more intentional way and in a more powerful way as I grow. So that's what we're, this is what we're talking about when we talk about pathways of discipleship for a local congregation. And you will work with your leaders to create a pathway that makes sense for you. I don't think it's, um, this is like this is why I'm saying it's not a program. It's not a program. We're not going to give you the recipe that works everywhere, but we're trying to get you to understand what the concept about a pathway is. But yours is going to look somewhat different from the next church down the road because you have unique giftedness. You have a different community that you're serving, which gives you different opportunities. And so it's going it's going to reflect the unique setting, the unique parish that God has given you to serve. Let me give you a few hints and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, here's a few hints for designing and implementing your pathway of discipleship. I would establish a, a discipleship pathway team because it takes a certain num number of vibrant people to be a catalyst to get the rest of the congregation engaged. That's very difficult if only one or two of you are involved in that. Delve into the scriptures that we've been lifting up here in the webinar and others that really focus on faith, love, grace, and discipleship. Describe in inspirational ways what discipleship looks like and why it really matters. And there can be all kinds of avenues for you to be bringing that up, stories of people's lives who've been transformed and many other ways of doing that. Um, study other congregations, pathways of discipleship and design your own. You can go on the internet and you can type in pathway of discipleship and a bunch of these things will come up on the internet. So you can, you can take a look at them, the ones that I have, except the membership one I created. But the rest of them are, were all by doing an internet search. Um, and then begin to look at, okay, how do we establish a cycle of these opportunities for people that give them intentional possibilities for their growth? and then invitation to do it. And then start to align the ministry areas of the local church to support and contribute to that pathway so that more and more people are moving deeper into discipleship. And you'll need to prepare leaders who are heading up these different experiences that you're offering so that they are done really, really well and done out of the motive of love and not out of other kinds of motives and then launch that pathway across the congregation and teach them what it's all about. And then do simple things like color coding the opportunities. So, so say to everybody, we really think it's important if you're gonna be a member of this congregation that um, you be on this pathway of discipleship. And provide them with tools that invite 
them to develop their own plan, where, which where are they going to fit in and how are they going to go full circle? And then monitor, you can monitor as leaders uh, how engaged people are in these processes and even individuals, where, where do their growth, where is their growth important? And this could be part of your small group ministry is where am I on the pathway? What, what do I sense is my next need uh, to go deeper? And mentors in these small groups can be, can be encouraging them. So I'm going to open it up. We have about five minutes. Uh, maybe we'll take a little bit longer for those of you who are able to stay on a little bit longer. What questions do you have? And Sarah will field those questions. And I'll start with one question that I already have. Um, Wynn Green sent me a question. And the question was, you know, we've been pretty successful at getting people uh, from beyond our community of faith interested in enrolling in our new member class, and that's gone very well. But getting them to commit to ongoing uh, faith-forming small groups has not been easy. Is there, can this successfully be mandated for membership? In other words, can we require people to be in small groups in order to become members? Um, that's a very interesting question. I think I think for some for some congregations they do require people to be in community and small group for a limited number of sessions prior to becoming a member and you could call that new member orientation if you want to but so maybe there are six sessions in which they do that i'm not aware of any congregations that require every member in order to continue to be a member to be in a small group um, so part of that really has to do with inspiration. I do know of congregations, however, that require their leaders to be in small groups. So if you want to, if you want to go into leadership within your congregation, then there's specific training and there are some practices that are part of your covenant in order to provide leadership. So that's something you could consider. Some congregations have done that. 